So I am Reverend Susan Hendershot, and I'm honored to serve as the president of Interfaith Power and Light. And our mission is to inspire and mobilize people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. So why are we here today? Well, faith leaders understand the importance of using their prophetic voices to call the faithful to live by their most deeply held values. In an election year, voting is one way that we can bring forth a world rooted in those values, values of justice, hope, courage, and love for all of God's creation, our sacred earth. But to do this, we need to make sure that people of faith are voting, and that starts with our congregations. Today, our panelists and I will discuss how we can encourage our faith communities to vote by offering sermons, devray Torah, and kutbahs on the importance of voting. We'll also share nonpartisan resources to help you in developing these messages to encourage the members of your faith community to vote. And so I want to uh, introduce our esteemed panelists today. I'm thrilled to have three wonderful faith leaders with us for this conversation. Rabbi Fred Sherlander Dobb is a member of the IPL Board of Directors and serves Adat Shalom Reconstructionist Congregation, an EPA Energy Star award-winning synagogue in Bethesda, Maryland. He has worked at the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, chaired the Maryland and Greater Washington Interfaith Power and Light, been president of the Washington Board of Rabbis, and received a doctorate of ministry from Wesley Theological Seminary. Now the chair of the Coalition on the Environment and Jewish Life, he lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Minna Sherlander Morse, and their children, Sarah and Gilead. Welcome, Rabbi Dobb. Reverend Dr. Gerald Durley serves as the chair of the Board of Interfaith Power and Light and is the pastor emeritus of the historic Providence Missionary Baptist Church of Atlanta, where he served for nearly 25 years. Reverend Durley's previous roles include executive director of the Head Start program for Fulton and Douglas counties director of the Health Promotion Resource Center at the Morehouse School of Medicine, and founder of Perspectives International, a consortium of historically Black colleges and universities. In 2011, Reverend Durley was inducted into the International Civil Rights Walk of Fame for his contributions during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, where he marched alongside Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders. Welcome, Reverend Durley. And Imam Mustafa El-Turk, who is the Imam and president of the North American Islamic Organization. He immigrated to the United States in 1976 amid the start of the Civil War in Lebanon to continue his higher education. He joined the Islamic Organization of North America in 1995 and served as the organization's education and training director from 1998 to 2003. Thereafter, he was appointed Amir, Imam and president of Iona, headquartered in Warren, Michigan. Imam El Turk was honored with the 2020 Interfaith Leader Award from the Interfaith Leadership Council of Metropolitan Detroit for his interfaith leadership and social justice activism. Currently, Imam El Turk is a member of the Imams Council of Michigan, where he served as a co chair. He serves on the University Islamic Center for Wayne State Board of Directors, serves on the inv advisory board of the Michigan Coalition of Human Rights, is a co founding member of the American Human Rights Council, and is the president of the American Society for Religious and Cultural Understanding a Dawa organization involved mainly in the prisons and correctional facilities. Welcome, Imam El Turk. And I also want to introduce IPL's Faith Climate Justice Voter Campaign Manager, Mike Kennedy, who will be compiling questions from our attendees for the Q&A session. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And we're going to we're gonna dive right into our conversation and questions uh, today. 
Um, and we will be saving some time for questions from our audience members as well. Um, so Reverend Durley, I'm just gonna dive in and start with you uh, and, and help, you can help us frame our conversation today. Um, why do you believe it is critical for us as faith leaders to offer messages on voting to members of our faith communities? First of all, let me thank you, Madam President, and to my colleagues, um, Imam El Turk and Rabbi Fred Dobbs, two tremendously gifted clergy people. It's vitally significant because when we talk about the faith community, there's one word that I think is synonymous with what we do across all of our faiths. That is to give hope in a hopeless situation where people are concerned about the impending perils in their life, whether it be police brutality, whether it be economic conditions, uh, and very seldom does climate change rise to that level of priorities because uh, people are dealing with everyday survival issues. But there's still a tremendous amount of hope that's given from our uh, mosque and from our synagogues and from our churches to say that there is something greater than us that holds us together that will get us through. So therefore, if we, we've got to have the, uh, the, the, the message that says that climate change is an integral part of all of this that we do. It's one thing to talk about some of the issues that impact us, but if we're dead because of uh, the heat or because of the toxins in the air in dirty water, it won't, make, it won't make much sense. So we now have gotten, we're the foundation. I think the faith community is the foundation of this. I came up with a phrase the other day, life. Uh, it's, it's a matter of life and breath, what we breathe, life and breath. And I think that the church and the synagogue and the mosque, we must talk to our parishioners and others about the significance of this. In all of our traditions and all of our pedagogical principles, we talk about depending on something greater than ourselves. And right now, we are challenging and destroying what God gave us, for some, what was a perfectly balanced ecological world. As we put people over profits, we are destroying that. So therefore, the faith community, must we must reassert ourselves in speaking truth to power. Mm, mm, yeah, speaking truth to power. Thank you. Thank you for that grounding. And and Rabbi Dove, I, I'm curious to know, and this is actually a question from IPL's Faithful Voter Reflection Guide, just so folks know we're gonna drop that information in the chat, but how do you see democratic values at risk today? You're living here in the nation's capital, um, you know, eyes on the ground. So how, how do you see that, uh, those values at risk? Beautiful, thank you. Honored to be with everyone. Um, and yes, the voter guide, the uh, it's either in the chat or soon will be, is a wonderful document that uh, doesn't purport to have the answers, but it poses the critical questions. And this is one of them. How is How are democratic values at risk today? At one level, it's so easy, we don't even need to stop to answer it. Just read the headlines. But going just a little deeper, I would say that there's a double-edged sword of a certain erosion of civility and also a certain lopsidedness in how much each of our faith communities seeks to enshrine our own religious or other values as law. So on civility, which our tradition calls derech eretz, simply the way of the land, it's, it's how you're supposed to be with others. And a beautiful line in our tradition that is so big about Torah and Torah study says that derech eretz, civility comes before Torah. Before your particular truth, you need to hold the larger truth as humbly as possible. Um, that's core in the American experience. Federalist paper number 10, uh, my favorite of the papers, uh, is exactly this, that we're all going to come together um, because there's never going to be a permanent majority because we have so many overlapping kinds of interests and interfaith is one of those. Um, and the larger interfaith notion, multi-faith gatherings of sector truths, I can only see well, a little slice and peripherally a much wider slice, but I've got no clue what's going on there. But if we're talking, you can see what's behind me and I can see what's behind you and we each see further when we are together. So we need to keep that in mind. We need to hold our truths just a little bit more humbly. But at the same time, this lopsidedness idea, religious pluralism, um, we're asking people of faith to be motivated by their core values and to lovely and humbly, those are religious values too, bring their ethics into the public square. But we're not 
hopefully none of us, trying to codify our one religion's laws as the law of the land, whether that's canon law, halakha, sharia, dharma. They're all good. And our society is better when people are informed by all of them and we come together in the public square and compare and contrast their ethics. Many of our more pluralistic communities will respect this so much that we hold back from full civic and political engagement as much as law and IRS codes and religious humility will allow. Many more insular and often less environmental communities simply don't. We've all got to get out there and we can agree on the nonpartisan work of voter registration and voter access as sacred starting places. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. And, and you pointed to the fact that you know, all of our religious traditions have something to offer to this conversation and that it's, it's all of us coming together that we can see the larger picture. And I think that's so beautiful. And, and I wanna to turn to Imam El Turk now, um, because I, I think um, it's, you know, some of our folks who are watching may be saying, you know, well, you know, how do our scriptural traditions even relate to this? You know, how, how are we talking about voting from a faith perspective? Um, you know, our scriptures don't necessarily speak to voting directly. So, so I'm just, I'm very interested, Imam, you know, how you see the Quran and the, Pro the Prophet Muhammad speaking to voting in a 21st century American democracy, just from, from your perspective. Oh, you are muted. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Reverend Susan, and my pleasure to be with such esteemed speakers and uh, religious leaders. Uh, to answer the question, uh, the Quran was revealed in 7th century Arabia, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, established Islam on the basis of divine justice as revealed to him. Muhammad, who happened to be God's prophet and messenger, was the political leader of the Islamic State he established in Medina, today Saudi Arabia. Although elections were used in ancient uh, Athens, uh, the origins of elections and casting votes in the contemporary world began after the French Revolution in late 16th century. Uh, French legislative elections were held in 1791 for the first time ever. In 7th century Arabia, the system of elections was based on uh, what we call bay'a or allegiance. And the system of bay'a or allegiance that was in vogue uh, was an expression of the collective vote or people's acceptance to the election of the caliph. Therefore, the democratic ideal of a government by the people is in essence compatible with the notion of an Islamic democracy. In absence of the prophet uh, Al-Farabi, uh, who died in 950, an early Islamic philosopher and political scientist, in one of his most notable works, al Madina Al-Fadila, The Virtuous City, considered democracy to be closest to the ideal state as practiced during the times of the rightly guided caliphs, al Khulafa al-Rashidun, those who succeeded Muhammad the, after his death. In modern times, however, the Islamic philosopher Alama Muhammad Iqbal died in 1938, also viewed the early Islamic caliphate as being compatible with democracy. He welcomed the formation of popular elected legislative assemblies in the Muslim world as a return to the original purity of Islam. He argued that Islam had the germs of an economic and democratic organization of society. We understand from these two great scholars of Islam that the spirit of democracy is indeed embedded in the pure form of Islam that was established by Muhammad and practiced by the rightly guided caliphs. However, there are ample verses in the Quran that talks about the importance of becoming civically engaged. For example, this one verse from chapter five says, and cooperate with each other in matters of goodness and righteousness and do not cooperate with one another in sin and hostility. 
couple of verses regarding standing up for justice, or you who believe stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God, even if it is against yourselves, your parents, or close relatives. One verse that is really important uh, uh, regarding the, the uh, ummah, what we call, or the community of believers, uh, God revealed in the, the third chapter, you are the best community, Ummah, brought forth for the good of mankind. You ordain good and forbid evil. So participating in elections and casting your vote is one way to civically engage. Mm. Wow, that was a great history lesson. And, and I feel like I just learned just an incredible amount from you. So thank you for framing that for us. Um, you know, from the Quran and from the, the Islamic tradition. And, and I, wanna, I wanna turn to Reverend Durley now because I wanna ask a similar question to him, uh, which is, you know, how you see Jesus and the, the Christian scriptures speaking to voting in a 21st century American democracy. I think we've, it's so important to understand now, we've got a lot of different discussions around a lot of different issues that's negatively impacting this democratic process. And when we come to climate change, when we come to what we're all about, we have to start from the premises that we are in, we are in an ethical moral warfare right now. And when you start talking about ethics and morality, that's where the faith community must no longer remain silent. When I think about uh, scriptures, even in the Old Testament that Rabbi Dobbs can talk about when we go back to Genesis, that God created a perfectly balanced ecological world, and we are simply stewards. We have a moral and an ethical responsibility to try to keep that ecological balance. When I read in the Old Testament from Isaiah, where it says, if we do not follow God's commandments, ecologically, so ecological consequences can result. There is a connection between the moral world and the natural world. We have an obligation. So uh, when, when I teach, uh, when I'm talking about that, I have to put it in perspective where it says there, the earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. That's what the prophet Isaiah said back then, that we were breaking the laws that were already put in place. Jesus talked about that. Uh, in, the, in that, in, this, in Luke, he says this, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection. What we talk about is that we have a moral and ethical conversation to involve everyone from the political, from the legislative, from the economic or the business world, and certainly from the moral world. I find that climate change is no respecter of color or faith. We're, as someone earlier stated, we're all in this together. So we speak from our perspective that we all have, and, and, and as you know, my involvement bringing the civil rights movement into it, it was so critical. We did not make a distinction now between the, the um, environment movement and our civil rights movement because we were fighting for not only justice and equality, but also equity when it came to those principles. And our base, all of us were based uh, from a biblical uh, perspective so I think that Jesus would take the point that we have, we are our neighbor's keeper and our neighbors are not necessarily the person who's right next to us, but our neighbors are plants, our neighbors are bees, our neighbors are the trees, our neighbors, and we're all in this together. We just have different forms of how we present. So we, we, we teach from the point, and particularly now, opening up those in the Christian faith to understanding what Jesus would say about this. And we even tied Dr. Martin Luther King into that. What would he say at this particular time? So those are the kinds of tenets that we try to do, that we, we understand that we have a moral and an ethical responsibility, and that transcends so many things that we're facing in today's world. So that's what we try to teach. And we always say organize, strategize, and then mobilize. What good is it to educate a people with the information and we not give them a channel to exercise those particular the elements of uh, what it is that we're trying to lead them to? And it all comes down to one word, as I said earlier, we must once again reestablish hope, hope. Mm. That's being desecrated across all of our faith, just the hope that it will be not a better tomorrow, but a better today. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Right, absolutely. Hope and hope is hope is what the faith community is is known for, right? We should be grounded in hope and and um, not just sort of the oh, I hope everything works out, right? That kind of kind of lackadaisical hope, but the the active hope that says that what we do makes a difference. And Bible says that, here's the principle that you asked for: faith without works is dead, <laughs> and none of us on this call are dead. We're alive. Faith without work. So I just, I just don't need a lot of faithful people. I need some folks to let's get in here and let's work. That's right. That's right. Amen. So, well, and, and Rabbi, let's turn to you because I, I want to, yeah, I know, I know uh, that, that uh, Reverend Durley uh, wasn't trying to steal your thunder by, by referring to the Hebrew scriptures, <laughs> but I want to turn to you now and, and ask, the same question, you know, how do the Torah and the prophets uh, speak to voting in a 21st century American democracy? Well, uh, like the good Reverend said, we're all in this together. I've spent a lot of my religious environmental career saying amen to Reverend Dr. Durley, and I, I do so today, and I and amen to uh, Imam Elturk. Um, so, as, as with these other beautiful perspectives, um, we all hold our traditions dearly, while we also celebrate how every era adds sanctity and perspective, right? Classical sources matter deeply, but so do the living, evolving interpretation we give them. So a commonality that's important to start with, the Holy Quran or the New Testament or the Talmud, and we're only Abrahamic, but also the Vedas and the Dharma and the ancestor stories, None of them are fully democratic in the modern sense, but in many ways they are proto-democratic, starting with the notion that we are all holy because we are reflections of the what our tradition calls the tselem, the image of the Holy One. And so while our traditions are much older, the Constitution in 1789 or in 1865, the 13th Amendment, early 1900s suffrage, the 1960s Voting Rights Act, all these were advances of holiness. Hmm. And we hold our traditions a little differently in light of these secular yet sacred steps. We need to acknowledge that the common ground of America and of modernity, while we, we may take issue with pieces of it, is also something to be celebrated. And in our own traditions, all religions celebrate freedom because we believe in the inherent dignity of each human being created as we are by God in that image. But our freedom is not do whatever the heck you want for yourself. You get ahead and don't worry about anyone else. It's freedom with purpose, liberty to be part of charting our collective destiny, autonomy to choose how to bring our best values into the public square, an agency to organize and donate and canvas and vote things not to take for granted like freedom of speech and assembly and faith and conscience, freedom to seek redress of grievances. And how do we do that? We vote and we organize as people of faith, motivated by our faith, working with others across differences of faith toward a more perfect union in which all are enfranchised. I wanted to spend most of the time on my answer just lifting up the common. In Jewish tradition, three very short texts. There's many more in the sermon resources. In the Talmud, almost 2,000 years ago, Rabbi Yitzchak taught a ruler is not to be appointed unless the community is first consulted. If that's not proto-democratic from antiquity, I don't know what is. Uh, a thousand years ago, Rashbam, uh, 900 years ago in Europe, a commentator, if in your opinion, the majority are about to commit an error in judgment, do not remain silent because they are in the majority. State your view. This applies even if you know beforehand that they will not accept your viewpoint. You still have that obligation. And finally, the Jewish tradition says, if something matters enough, it's no longer just a good idea. It's mandated. Like charity, you can give even more, but a certain amount of generosity is actually obligatory, not just voluntary. We, we call it sadaka, not just charity, but righteousness and justice. Same for voting and for involvement in the democratic enterprise within a free society. It's not just a good idea. It's, religiously speaking, the law. Voting and defending democracy is, in Jewish parlance, a mitzvah, a sacred obligation that is, in turn, also an awesome opportunity. I pray that we can all articulate in our own faith language 
how this is, in fact, a holy imperative for all of us. Mm. Wow, that was that was amazing. And and I, I love this idea of, you know, that you shared of um, this advancement of holiness. I, I, I really like that framing um, and bringing our best values into the public square. That seems so important. You know, we're talking about voting, voting our values. And I do want to point really quickly to uh, Sandy uh, in our chat who shared from the Baha'i faith, uh, the fourth Abrahamic religion. Uh, and and uh, uh, Sandy uh, shared a piece of scripture that says, um, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in and center your deliberations on its exig exigencies and requirements. Take an active part in counteracting the wave of materialism, bitterness, and selfishness, which is sweeping over the whole world. That's really beautiful. Thank you, Sandy, for sharing that in the chat. And, uh, you know, again, I think that that speaks to bringing our best values into the public square. And so, you know, thinking about that, you know, I want to turn back to Imam El Turk and just uh, and ask you, you know, what what can our faith leaders and faith communities do to encourage voting beyond just offering a message, you know, thinking along the lines of how we bring our best values into the public square? Mm. Uh, you know, beyond the sermons and speeches on the importance of participating in the electoral process, we encourage our members who are U.S. citizens. Our congregation is mainly immigrant, uh, so we have a, a section of the community that uh, that are non-citizens. So our address are to those who are citizens. Of course, for those who are not citizen yet, we encourage them to become citizens so they can exercise their right to vote and be part and parcel of the process here in the United States of America. So we encourage uh, those who are citizens to register to vote. Uh, we hold register to vote drives in uh, our mosques and elsewhere. We also encourage those who are registered to vote to actually go out and vote. Many people uh, register to vote, but they don't exercise their right to vote. And for elders, and now anyone for that matter can cast their vote through the absentee voting uh, uh, by mail. So we encourage that uh, as well. Uh, we help those uh, in need of a ride to the poll station uh, to have volunteers to take them to the poll stations. And we make uh, sure that they remember the dates. Oftentimes, you know, uh, they're oblivious of when is it when who can miss the date of November, right? Uh, the date of voting. Uh, they are encouraged, of course, to uh, wear the I voted sticker. That is very important, you know, for us to encourage others. Yes, wear it and be proud that you have uh, voted. Uh, it's just a way to remind others when they come in contact with other people. Uh, we provide a platform uh, for candidates uh, to, uh, you know, we invite them to talk about themselves, what they want to achieve, and uh, how we should, uh, why we should vote for them. Uh, we direct them to candidates by providing their, you know, cards, postcards, or websites to learn more about them. Uh, and basically, we invite them to vote their conscience, whatever it is, just uh, exercise your right to vote. What is important is that you exercise your right to vote and vote your conscience. Mm. So many options that, that you provide. It's really inspiring uh, to think Can about. Can I add something to what he just oh, yeah, said? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted to add, El, uh, uh, Imam El Turk was so on target. 62 years, what he just said is what John Lewis and all of us said in 1960, educating the people. We had to stand up when they would ask the question, you, you can vote. You black folks can vote if your parents voted. We know the answer to that. You can vote if you can tell us the number of bubbles in this bar of soap, or in the number of jelly beans in this. 
So we've gone through the voter suppression. And now in 2022, here in Georgia, we're facing what we call SB202, where they're removing ballot boxes. Uh, you, if you give somebody a drink of water, they, they can take them out of the line of voting because they think they're influencing. So we're going back through that. So the techniques that we must use in our various places of influence is that we've got to understand to get people to vote, they will vote on issues which are germane to their survival. And that's where democracy has always taken the case, but they cannot be intimidated by the kind of new laws of suppression that are, be, are coming on. And so I think that what he was talking about in terms of getting people to vote, but educating them about voting, and because of the structure, you can't tell them who to vote for. I used to say, I don't care. I, you all can vote for whoever you want to. But if you're going to stay here at Providence, this is who I'm voting for. But And, uh, and you share those ideas because they will vote. We, uh, and they will register and vote. We, this is the, what, 60th year of pe getting people to register, but they will register when they say, how does this directly impact me physically, mentally, economically, and spiritually? And that's, I think that that's the role that we play in the faith community to make those things alive. Not the speeches and not the rallies and all of that. We've rallied enough, but putting that in the hands and then people, I think will take the responsibility to move. I mean. They used to ask us for poll taxes. And uh, I remember once there was a story where you could vote if you could quote the Constitution. These were the kinds of <laughs> draconian ways that they did then. Now they've just become a little more sophisticated. So we've got to, once again, break down those barriers and make it live in people's gut. Mm. Mm -hmm. So inspiring. And, and Reverend Durley, you've certainly seen uh, your share of voter disenfranchisement uh, with your work, at, um, you know, early on in the civil rights movement, um, but particularly even now continuing on with some of the things you're seeing uh, living in Georgia, some of the voter suppression tactics that are happening there. Um, and of course, we know that th those are happening in other parts of the country as, of, you know, as well. So, so just want to appreciate you for um, both your words and your actions um, in, in being a leader uh, in this fight and making sure that people are able to vote and understand that they are able to vote. Um, really just a great appreciation to you. And this is why this IPO guide is so effective. The IPO guide that was put out, it's very expected uh, how to ask questions and, or of the candidates. And I think it's a great, great tool that can be used. That's, that's right. And thank you for giving it another plug. And I know Mike is dropping that into the chat again. And, and Rabbi Fred, I just want to bring, bring you into the conversation uh, here as well. And just curious uh, if there's anything you would add to the conversation about what uh, faith communities can do to encourage voting beyond offering a message. I know uh, we've had a lot of conversations so far and, and curious for your insights or anything else that your congregation is doing at this point. Um, so unfortunately, our polarized community is such that many of us live in, quote, blue or red states and purple is the minority. And often many of us pray in disproportionately blue or red congregations, even though, of course, the, at best, religion is trans-partisan. Um, but values align in certain ways. And those who stand up for full enfranchisement of all voters, those who stand up for protection of the earth, are historically found on both sides of the aisle, but increasingly sometimes in this hyper-polarized reality, only in one. So it is about, to my mind, walking this sacred tightrope, again, of holding our values humbly and maintaining civility and being ready to talk with anyone respectfully because we are all created in the image of God, um, however dis differently informed or differently prioritizing things um, we may find others and others may find us, while at the same time holding our truths and not sacrificing when it comes to the enfranchisement of every voter, of every color and every religion, and not sacrificing when it comes to the protection of every vulnerable community and every endangered species. And that is easier said than done, but the more we talk with each other about it, the closer we will get to it. 
And so even in our bluest or our reddest congregations, in our reddest or our bluest states, we need to hold both halves of that, the humility and the fervency and clarity of our values. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we're, we're shortly going to turn to audience questions. So just a reminder, uh, if you have a question uh, for our panelists, please drop it into the Q&A. So we're, we make sure to see it. I know the chat's very busy. So if you put it in the Q&A, we'll be sure to see it. Um, but as we get ready to transition, Imam, I want to turn back to you because I know that we may have folks who are on this, this call today with us who are uh, clergy, religious leaders in their congregations, uh, in their mosques and synagogues, uh, who are apprehensive about offering a message on voting for whatever reason. Uh, they might think it's too partisan. They might think that it's not even, uh, you know, we're not even allowed to do it as religious leaders because it goes against the separation of church and state, um, you know, multitude of other reasons. But I'm just curious what encouragement you would offer them. Yeah, thank you, uh, Reverend. You know, some faith leaders in our communities, the Muslim communities, may be apprehensive and uneasy to encourage voting because one, they believe that it is un-Islamic. In this case, you know, uh, you would say we agree to disagree because there's uh, no point in uh, carrying this uh, further when they uh, truly believe that this is against the scripture, this is not uh, how Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, established uh, Islam, it is against the where we disagree, of course. However, I believe most Islamic centers and their faith leaders encourage their congregations to vote. And I, as I say in my sermon, uh, this is a quotation from a sermon I gave on civic engagement is our duty. Uh, I say the narrative of whether Muslim American citizens are permitted to vote in the national or local elections has been debated and the overwhelming majority of scholars domestically and abroad have permitted the particip participation in the political electoral process here in now it's up to you know the individuals to uh, take that or not but secondly too faith leaders may be apprehensive because of the 501c3 tax exempt status it is true that a nonprofit organization is not allowed to endorse a particular candidate or party. However, they are allowed to invite candidates to their mosques, churches, uh, synagogues, uh, other houses of worship, for that matter, and present themselves and what they have to offer. The key point here is nonprofit organizations cannot endorse a candidate or a party. Mm. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> so you ever really jump on in. Yeah, what I wanted to say, you use the term fear. You use the term fear. And, and, and when uh, Imam was talking about the fear of the 501c3, fear is predicated for, on a word that is killing America right now, ignorance. ignorance. This call is to get rid of that ignorance. See, when you're fearful of something, you're ignorant. Uh, America was afraid of a lot of Black folks because they were ignorant about what we were doing it. Fearful of Muslims because they don't really understand Muslims. At times, fear, fearful of other things. So we've got to eradicate that, that ignorance. And once we eradicate the ignorance, then we can get beyond the fear factor and move to our more positive collaborations to work together. That's why I think the interfaith community, because we all have certain preconceived notions about what others will do. And a lot of clergy people, as he was saying, uh, wonder, do we cross over that line because they're ignorant of the real issues and how they can do it. So once we, and this is what this is about, eradicating the ignorance to alleviate the fear so that we can come together for common common issue. And I think, I love what he said in his sermons. Uh, I love a, a sermon I did. And for those of you who are trying to get a sermon out of this, listen, Mike quickly. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. That's in Chronicle back in the Old Testament. And, but I take that, if you hear from heaven and listen to God, and he said, do this, 
And another thing from Esther, the Old Testament, again, another sermon. If I perish, let me perish, but I'm going to make a difference for the good of God's creation. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So, and we're going to turn to Q&A just here in a moment, um, bring in um, Mike Kennedy from our team. Um, but those of you who are watching today, we want to encourage you to drop in the chat ideas you have for a sermon on voting or one you've already offered. Uh, so we're just want to do some idea sharing. And of course, uh, Reverend Durley just uh, gave you a mini sermon as well that you can you can take and run with. Um, but please drop in some ideas into the chat to share with others. Um, and I see folks are also dropping in other resources to share. We really appreciate that. And Mike, we want to bring you in. I think we have a couple of questions from audience members. And uh, there's still time to submit uh, some if you'd like to. But Mike, I want to turn to you and, and let you uh, begin that those you know, sharing those questions from our audience. Thank you, Susan. And thank you all for a great conversation. We've had a couple of questions come in so far. And there's still time for you to drop a question that you have in uh, Q&A or if you're watching on Facebook. So a question came in from Michigan, which all of you have in part spoken to, but I want to lift it up again in the words of the person who asked it and invite you to offer something that you didn't get a chance to add, to add uh, or have a, you know, a fresh insight. And I think I'll start with, with Rabbi Dobb on this one. Um, the question from Michigan is this. What do our panelists have to say to their fellow faith leaders who might shy away from preaching about, and the air quotes are the askers and mine, politics? Why shy, you know, shying away from preaching politics? How do our panelists address political issues in a nonpartisan way? A new or fresh insight on that question? So, um Political and partisan need to be separate. They start with the same letter, but they, they, it is, a, I believe, a religious duty as well as the law of the land that we preach apolitically in the sense of partisan. No party, no candidate has a monopoly on truth, and we need to be humble enough to own that. At the same time, our values have always been about, as George Fox of the Quaker tradition would say, speaking truth to power. And who's he quoting? He's quoting Jeremiah, he's quoting Isaiah, he's quoting the prophets that, that, that are considered prophets in all three of these Abrahamic faiths and, and beyond. Um, and you know, Isaiah chapter 57 and 58 comes down really hard on the status quo saying, you think that, that just going through the motions of the status quo is where it's at? And just religion meaning ritual? Come on people. The fast that I desire, says the Holy One, is to break the fetters of wickedness, to let the oppressed go free. When you see the hungry, feed them. When you see the naked, clothe them. Then, and only then, shall your light break forth like the dawn. In other words, we need systems. We need the reality of people being protected. And for that to happen, people have to have a voice. And for that to happen, people have to be enfranchised, and then they have to make the choice to exercise that, that voice. And so politics in the sense of putting values into the public square is another name for religion. Partisanship in the sense of the specifics of a candidate and a party in any given moment in history, we need to hold at a uh, remove as people of faith. Amen, Rabbi. You got an amen, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi Fred. Yeah, can I? Here's another question from Maggie, uh, a big picture question. How do you educate potential voters? What are some ways that in your faith communities you've educated voters in an appropriate way, maybe beyond offering a message? And uh, Reverend Durley, could you speak to that one? Yeah, I, I think too. Uh, and, and, and again, it goes back to something I said earlier. Uh, and and, and uh, I know that uh, Imam El Turk was going to say something on that last issue, and he'll get back to it. But I think it comes down to 
as I said, they're not the political issues. We're in an ethical and a moral situation. So if any of you who are not necessarily clergy, but you need your leader, your spiritual leader in your area, you've got to let them know that they have an obligation. They have been, we call it in our tradition, called for such a time as this to speak to the, to the conditions of our people. And in speaking to the conditions of our people, they might not understand all the political nuances, but they do know something, a word, can I use a word that we don't use now? right and wrong. There are certain things that are just not right. It's not right what these petroleum companies are doing. It's not right what they're doing in uh, the gas uh, gas and, and, and fuel. So in doing it, you're not talking about uh, red or blue or you're talking about some basic fundamental ethical questions that need moral answers too. And that will give people the impetus to try to move ahead uh, to make a difference. And I think that that's how you inspire people. Uh, Susan will tell you, when I first got into the movement 10 years ago, I met some of the most intelligent people. They knew everything about the environment and they were very wealthy, but they were dull. I mean, I didn't want to listen to them. You got to be excited. We, we're, fight, we're in an exciting world. We're fighting Atlanta housewives on TV. So we've got to put some pizzazz in what we're talking about. No one, a polar bear will do this. No, this is what we... Uh, the air is like, no, no, carbon dioxide, pollution. So it's the excitement that if you want to get people on board and the people then will push the leaders. Leaders will only go just so far because we, we have our, our limits. But when the people get excited, as Dr. King once said, I cannot talk to you anymore. I've got to go catch my people. That means you've got a movement. When the people are catching the leader, you've got a movement. If the leader is out there by himself, then it's just, he's just a walk in the park. Thank you, thank you, Reverend Durley. Uh, also for that sneak peek into the television shows that you like to watch. <laughs> we are going to, um, for our final question, actually go I, back can I, to- Can I jump in? Because yeah, the, sure. Because the imam wanted to I, 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 a little I, bit to the former question and, and I yeah. think it's not too late to do so. <laughs> if I may very quickly, just uh, to concur with the rabbi, you know, speaking truth to power is embedded uh, in so many places in the Quran as well, maybe in a different context. However, uh, consider this verse, oh, you who believe, stand up for justice as witnesses to God. It's all about justice. You have to speak truth to power and you have to stand up for justice as witnesses to God. Because after all, we're all created in the image of God and we have to do his will here in uh, on earth, uh, this beautiful earth that God created for us so perfect. I have a sermon on, uh, you know, climate change and all that. It's so beautiful how for billions of years, the, the earth was running according to the cosmic uh, balance that God created. And it took only what hundred and some years to destroy what God had created so perfectly. So th that that's one uh, uh, idea that uh, perhaps uh, our voters can consider uh, when they are looking for individuals to vote for, how uh, are they supporting this, uh, you know, crisis, uh, or not supporting, but rather, how are they addressing this crisis that we have uh, here? I want to share with you very quickly a, uh, a, a statement from uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad who said, Whoever sees munkar, the word Arabic is munkar, which means something that is detested, something that is evil, let him change it by hand. If he is unable to, then he should or she should speak out against it. If they can't, then they should feel it in their heart. And this, this is the weakest of faith. This is the weakest of faith. So we are encouraged. And typically, I use the word hand to mean authority. We could change things through the courts, but more so through the ballot. Go out and vote. Put your take with your hand this ballot and stick it in the in the you know in the box. Uh, so, so it's very important that. And by the way, uh, President Biden ran his campaign on this slogan, on this saying, to gain uh, to gain you know Muslim uh, votes. Or what is he doing about the evil that's going on around the world, including climate change, one may ask. Beautiful. And of course, we do know that it takes, 
takes our hearts, right? It takes our deeper values, um, but but it also takes our hands. It takes it takes faith and it takes works, right, Reverend Durley? So um, so we um, we are out of time for our Q and A. It's that was so helpful, and I do want to share just a few ideas with folks about how you can get involved. We have a lot of resources, some of which have already been going into the chat. Um, but we do have a resource for sermons, DeVray Torah and Kutbas on the importance of voting, a resource that we, would, we will be sharing with you in the chat. Um, you'll also receive uh, some of this information in uh, an email tomorrow. So if you've registered for this, you will also be getting this via email and the recording will also be available for you. Um, do let us know if you're going to uh, provide a message to your congregation on the importance of voting. Um, we have a way for you to share that information with us, and we'd we'd love to know if you're doing if you're doing that in your congregation, in your synagogue, uh, in in your mosque or um, temple, other um, congregational settings. Um, we also want you to, of course, encourage your faith community to vote. And one of the ways that we are partnering as Interfaith Power and Light is with the organization uh, When We All Vote. And uh, we have a link for you that you can share with those in your congregation where they can check their registration status or they can register to vote if they are not currently registered. So we'll share that link for you as well. And of course, we want you to pledge to be a faith climate justice voter. So you can take the pledge, invite your friends, family, and faith community to take the pledge uh, at the link that we are sharing with you. And you'll be joining with thousands of others across the country who are pledging to be a faith climate justice voter. So we want you to join that community. Uh, encourage one of your faith community leaders to be a congregation captain. Uh, as a captain, you'll be a lead for your faith community with the Faith Climate Justice Voter Campaign. We already have 55 volunteer congregation captains and you can join them and you will get more specific uh, information that you can share with your faith community once you join as a congregation captain. And these are very important volunteers for our campaign. And of course, you can learn more about the campaign at our campaign website, faithclimatejusticevoter.org. And we're dropping that link for you in the chat as well. And if you're so inclined, we encourage you to donate to power the Faith Climate Justice Voter Campaign. One of the things we're doing this fall is reaching out through text banking to try to reach a half million voters in our target states. And we will be uh, doing that through volunteer text banking. And uh, we know that that works. We did the same in 2020 with phenomenal results. And we're very excited to um, be reaching out to these half million uh, low propensity voters again this year. And uh, you can certainly help us do that with your, uh, with your donation. And so with that, I know that we want to close out our time together today. We wanna to thank you for attending and being a part of this important conversation. Uh, if you have other questions that we didn't cover, you can send them to us at info at interfaithpowerandlight.org. And we will try to get back to you with the answers uh, to those questions as well that we didn't get to today or if anything new um, pops up for you. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording and the links from today's webinar via email with you tomorrow. And of course, I wanna thank our three just incredible panelists today for sharing their wisdom and knowledge with us, Rabbi Fred Sherlander Dobb, Reverend Dr. Gerald Durley, and Imam Mustafa El Turk. Your wisdom and insight has certainly been a blessing to all of us. And I just deeply thank you for the time and the care that you've given us to our community here today. And thank you to all of you for, for joining us. Oh, Reverend Durley, we're gonna give- I, I'd, like to impose, I'd like to impose on my other two panelists. If you could do a 30, I, I believe whenever something this good when we start, we close in prayer. We thank Allah 
We thank Jehovah Jireh. If my other two panelists could, if we could just give a little 30 second closing prayer, benediction, farewell, that, that just kind of ties it together. If the Imam and Fred, if we could just do three little short interfaith prayers. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Reverend Susan and, and Mike and Tiffany and IPL. This is beautiful. Adaptation of traditional Talmudic prayers about the need for civic engagement using the language of mitzvah, of obligation. Baruch uh, Adonai Elohim Blessed are you, eternal God, spirit of the universe, Asher Kitshanu Vimipsotav Vitzivanu, who has inspired us through your commandments and instructed us, La'asok Batsarchei Tzibor, to engage in the needs of the full community. This is sacred. Mom? Yeah, I can go next. Um, I, I will, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Reverend, and thank you in the background uh, to Mike and Tiffany, uh, who had been really a great help for us here. And uh, I can close with this uh, verse from chapter 49, uh, verse 13, uh, that says, uh, Oh, mankind, we created you, we, the royal, we, majestic, we, God Almighty, created you from a single male and a female. That's Adam and Eve. That uh, denotes the equality among all human beings before God at the religious, at the moral, at the spiritual level. And we made you into different nations and tribes, uh, the, the blacks, the whites, uh, all every color in between, the different races. What for? To learn from one another, to know one another. So I pray that uh, we as Americans living in this very diverse uh, country, that we work together toward the goodness of uh, all humanity, the goodness of uh, God's creation, and uh, we pray that we love one another and come together in peace and harmony. Amen. I mean, eternal and almighty, in the Christian tradition, eternal and almighty divine, righteous God, the giver of every good and perfect, excellent gift. It is once again that you brought us together in this Kairos moment to share and to grow and to live. Now, God, I ask that you would bless each person that we do not just come on a Zoom call and a webinar but there's something that reached down into the very DNA of our spirituality that will make us a touchstone when somebody sees us at the grocery store, at the shopping mall, that they'll say there is something about that person that's saying, I've got to get involved and make a difference in mitigating climate change and reaching out to my brothers and my sisters across the board. God, we thank you for this moment and we give you all the praise and all of the glory in everything that we do as we depart from this place, but never from your presence. We ask it all in the powerful name of a risen Savior that we pray to. Amen. 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 And blessings, everyone. Blessings on your journey. We're so glad you're part of the IPL community. Thank you again for being here.